Today on Locked On Canadians, the Canadians are on deadline to sign a couple of goalies. What do the Panthers of this year have in common with the Stanley Cup run the Canadians pulled off uh, two years ago? And finally, what is an early prediction of what the opening night roster will look like? Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to episode 835. As you know, we are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, so we're free and available wherever you get your podcasts, as well as on YouTube, and we're your team every day. My name is Laura Sab, also known as The Active Stick, and I'm joined by Scott Matlove, Habs Eyes on the Prize. Uh, Scott, the other Scott, was here uh, filling in for you <laughs> yesterday. It was a really fun episode, and and we got a lot of good feedback from the listeners. I'm glad it was a great discussion with Jay Foster. Uh, and so, Scott, how are you and how was your day off? It was a lovely Memorial Day weekend. We went down into the Finger Lakes with a good friend of ours, uh, went out wine tasting, stopped at a brewery or two, had some fresh dairy or fresh dairy farm ice cream, made some s'mores, hung out with the dog who is now passed out on the couch to my left over here. And my left, your right, whichever way I'm pointing on your YouTube screen right now. It was a good it was a good weekend. Uh, I am completely lost on the fact that today is Monday, not Sunday. So when I get something wrong date wise this week on the show, it's because of that. And I'm going to stick to that for the time being right now. I keep forgetting that it was Memorial Day weekend. I thought Scott just like took a random Sunday off and I was so happy about it. <laughs> but no. Listeners, help me bully Scott into taking more time off. In the meantime, the Canadians seem to be taking time off because they haven't done anything in quite some time. And it turns out that there is a deadline. If the Canadians do not sign prospect goaltenders Joe Verbatic and Frederick Dishow by June 1st, then they lose their rights. Now, this is not unique to the Canadians. There's a ton of uh, teams that haven't done this just yet. There is, at the time you're listening to this, it's hopefully in the morning of uh, May 30th. So there is, you know, a day and a bit. Uh, and I don't know, Scott, like, I, is this one of those things where the Canadians are just, you know, on deadline or, or, you know, doing, doing things at the last minute, or is this something where you think they're reevaluating whether these two prospects belong in the organization at all? I, it's a weird situation because the minor league system is not loaded with goaltending prospects right now. Yes. The NHL Samuel Montembeau and Jake Allen, which, okay, is fine. But now Caden Primo is waiver eligible this season, which now makes him a risk to likely potentially be claimed because he is a reliable AHL starter who is still trying to find his feet at the NHL level. And there are a lot of teams with goaltending issues who are rebuilding who will take a risk and take a chance on that and kind of leave the Canadians up in the air. They have Jakob Dobish signed to a two-year entry-level deal. He will be likely with Laval next year. And I'm not sure if they're going to bring back Kevin Poulin for a third straight year as the veteran netminder there because Verbatic was the youngest player in the ECHL this year uh, playing for the lions. He played a couple of games for the rocket. He signed an AHL only deal last year. Uh, he wasn't an overager when he was drafted, but there his age fell in a certain window that they signed him to an AHL deal to play here. And Frederick Dichaud has been playing for, for Lunda. He's been playing for a very big club over in Europe a little bit older older in terms of prospect 22 years old he's really someone that I thought would they would go after and sign this year he played fairly well for Denmark at the world championships as well as you can behind a team that is not in the top tier there and I thought his performance there would probably get him extended even if they I think it's safe to issue a qualifying offer or I think it's an entry-level deal and I'm surprised that they haven't signed one of them yet because they're not exactly rich on goaltending depth. But with this, they can let these rights expire. Some players who might be 19 or 20 will re-enter the NHL draft if they choose to do so. And I'm wondering if the Canadians are going to go, we're going to let your rights expire for an NHL entry-level deal, which would take up a contract spot, and choose to 
sign them then to an AHL deal and be like, we're going to, st- we still want to sign you, but we don't want to waste that NHL spot on there. It's something I would like them to do. There's a lot of other names in here that are interesting to me, but for the Canadians, I think they're just trying to get one or both of these guys back on AHL deals next season. Which makes total sense because right now I don't think that they're ready to rule them out, right? And here in in the market, we're not in a panic mode or anything like that. Like, And particularly, you know, Samuel Montambo just won um, gold at the World Championships and he was a fantastic goaltender throughout that 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 tournament as well as you know in Montreal he really did uh he took some strides you know he really kind of came into his own the Canadians are set for right now but they're going to need elite goaltending when they're at the point of elite contention so I don't think that you know they've ruled this out just yet like I don't think it's it's there's been enough sample size for them to understand what they truly have in these two players they think um I think it's going to be okay. Like, I don't think that there's anything that we should panic about. Uh, Scott, were there any interesting names in that as yet to be signed list from Cap Friendly that uh, we were perusing earlier? The the Brock. biggest name. What? Other teams, not us. Other teams, oh. not the Canadians. <laughs> there were two names that really stuck out on this list that I went, okay. Uh, one of them is uh, Patrick Pistola, who is in Edmonton. He was drafted by Carolina, traded in some kind of deal uh, to Edmonton. He's 22 years old. He has a contract next year in Finland. Uh, biggest thing is mainly goal scoring, not a lot else in there. And the name that sticks out the most to me, and I'm assuming he hasn't been signed yet because his team is playing in the Memorial Cup, is Justin Robida, who is playing for the Quebec Ramparts in the Memorial Cup right now. 2021 fifth round pick by the Carolina Hurricanes. And yes, he is Stefan Robida's son, which I'm now curious if Carolina doesn't qualify him or sign uh, Justin Robida. I'm looking at his numbers here. 43 points in 57 games for Valdor, 36 points in 35 games for Valdor, 82 points in 68 games, 42 and 27 and then 36 and 36 this year split between Valdor and Quebec. It's a player that if they don't qualify him, add him on an AHL deal and see where you've got there. There's family ties to that, which maybe might rub people the wrong way a little bit, but why not take a chance on that? It's something that I think would be an interesting take here because a bunch of these are players that are staying overseas. So it's like, okay, they, they, they're not in the time frame there, but I look at Robida who is, and I'm looking at this correctly. He's 20 years old playing in you know Quebec right there he fits along that timeline I'm not saying he's going to become a superstar but it couldn't hurt to add some of that talent back into the minor league system here uh funny enough uh there is a Bobby Orr who is on this list a Robert Orr for Carolina um but outside of that there's not a whole lot of names that I see that I go gotta go for that um there's an Arvid Costamar that I remember It was a big to do in Vancouver about that, but that might just be Vancouver being Vancouver. Uh, If I'm the Canadians and I'm letting Dishon Verbatic go and I'm looking for someone off this list, I think Justin Robida is at the top of that. Even if he doesn't become more than an AHL player, it's found money basically at this point. Pretty much. And I just wanted to talk about how, you know, all this time it's been decades and decades that people are looking for the next Bobby Orr. And there he is, a literal Bobby or in the <laughs> Carolina system. All right, we are going to move on to uh, a fun topic that was suggested by one of our listeners. Uh, and that's all coming up in just one moment. But first, this episode is brought to you by Athletic Greens. Keeping up with proper nutrition is really hard. You're busy, you're stuck at your desk, you're eating whatever you can just to get through your day, you're podcasting. But what if you could start your day with the ultimate daily nutritional insurance? With a single scoop of AG1 and a glass of water, you can do just that and absorb 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to recover. And it cost him $100 a day. That is ridiculous. $100 a day, which just isn't sustainable. He created Athletic Greens after experiencing how difficult it was to create an optimal nutrition routine on your own. 
And it's all for around just $3 a day. $3 a day as compared to $100 a day. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL network. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash NHL network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right. So uh, our listeners have been getting advance on the mailbag, mostly because I whined about not having topics in the off season <laughs> on Twitter the other day and our lovely friend goalie joy came up with a great uh topic that is compare the 2021 hab stanley cup run with the current florida panthers stanley cup run and i think it's a couple of things obviously in the case of both teams they kind of squeaked in at the end they didn't really seem to have that much promise through over the course of the season I uh, they ended up beating teams that were Stanley Cup favorites, including do you remember that time, Scott, that Toronto yes. went up three one on the Montreal Canadiens and then they blew the entire series? I don't know if you remember. I mean, it's hard to forget. It like it's truly one of the funniest moments of the last like ten years in hockey, and there's been a lot of them. And the whole, like, comparing Florida to Montreal, we've done it a little bit on this podcast, there is a lot that I can see in that. There is the older, formerly, like, top-of-the-world elite goaltender who's been battling through injuries that have changed the way that they play the way of hockey and their talents and their abilities, and they have just put it together at the right possible time. And that is, you know, Carey Price for the Canadians and Sergei Bobrovsky for uh, the Florida Panthers there. They both beat Toronto. Admittedly, the Panthers handled them potentially a little bit easier than the Canadians did. But Florida had the benefit of coming back from a 3 nothing series deficit to beat the Bruins in round one. The heavily favored Boston Bruins, like the President's Trophy winning Boston Bruins, the last dance Boston Bruins, they didn't care about any of that. And the thing about the Panthers is they're getting the one big difference here. And I think out of everything else is they're, they're getting a, an absolutely clutch run from Matthew Kachuk. And that's not to say the Canadians didn't have their own clutch players and everything during their Stanley cup run, but Matthew Kachuk scoring the four seconds left to finish off that series against yeah, Carolina, sweeping Carolina, no less. Scoring some of those goals or setting up those goals in the Toronto series, scoring overtime winners in the Carolina series. He has been right where they needed him every for every step of the way there. That's the biggest difference. The Canadians got goal scoring by committee. You know, they had the Nick Suzuki overtime winner. They had the Cole Caulfield. Uh, to, no, that was the same game. They had the Jesperi Kotkaniemi overtime winner. They had the Tyler Toffoli overtime winner. They had Josh Anderson twice. The Panthers seemingly have that higher end piece there. But like you said, last team into the playoffs should have lost in round one, weren't favored in round two, weren't favored in round three, and then just stone cold Steve Austin flipped the double birds to everybody and just kept winning games. And admittedly, was not cheering for the Panthers because draft picks, draft picks are important. And we went from, we might pick in the top 10 twice to our second first round pick is 31st or 32nd now. And at this point, I'm just going for the ride, enjoying the chaos. And if it means the Panthers win the Stanley Cup, sick, all about it. And I think that's the most fun thing. But this run's been unexpected. Nobody, you cannot tell me anybody expected the Panthers to do this. Just like nobody expected the Canadians to do this. And even Canadians fans are like, if we went around, great. It'll be because of Carey Price, which it was, going to the Stanley Cup final, so much extra gravy on the poutine from there. There are a couple of other things too, is that both teams have had question marks in, in, in behind the bench, right? That's a big one. And I, I feel like with Dominique Ducharme, he was a lot more, a, a lot less proven. The thing with Paul Maurice is that he's proven to be very one note and one dimensional. He didn't succeed with, with uh, Winnipeg and, and 
now I'm asking myself the question, like, is he able to adapt or is he just simply out coaching these coaches that tend to be more adaptable than he is? I mean, I got a lot of questions about Sheldon Keefe, I got to tell you, but Rod Brindamore has proven to be, uh, in my mind, a better coach than him, you know? But Maurice just has longevity. He has a lot of, he has a lot of experience. And I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, like, what is, what is the situation here? Like, is, is he simply like out smarting these other coaches? I mean, he didn't outsmart Dominique Ducharme. Yeah. Like that's the thing is it's <laughs> like there, Paul Maurice has been around the block. He, he likely has picked up some things here. I don't think the Panthers are winning because of Paul Maurice. I certainly don't think they're winning because of his assistant coach, Sylvain Lefebvre. I think they've got just a team that is riding high on swagger right now. Because when the Panthers were bad this year, and they were bad, they were bad, bad. They were a lottery team spending all this money and trying to make this push after trying to go all in last year and failing miserably in the first round. They limped into the playoffs. They barely made the playoffs and are in the Stanley Cup final. The Canadians had a little bit more cushion in that, you know, North Division, Canadian Division, whatever we want to call it. I, it, the, I don't. I at some point, you know, when the magic wears off, what happens to Paul Maurice when Sergei Bobrovsky is not a, let's even say a nine fifteen goalie? What happens then? And I don't think he'll be long for the world because now that the Panthers have gotten here, they know what this tastes like. You have expectations. This is not a Panthers team that it needs to rebuild. They're in a spot where they should be making the playoffs and competing every year. And now that you have hit almost the summit here, what are you going to do if it all comes crashing down? Because, yeah, Paul Maurice got you to a Stanley Cup final. Got you there. But you got to make that decision. Dominic Ducharme was behind the bench when the Canadians went to the Stanley Cup final. He got fired, what, six months later? It, it's a cruel sport. And I the Panthers now... You can't settle for, well, he got us there before he can do it again because there's no guarantees of that. And absolutely, I'm curious to see how they avoid that potential hangover from that. The Canadians fell off the face of the earth through managerial incompetence and coaching incompetence, but as well as injuries, as well as injuries. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So many injuries. So it's a lot of fun. It does remind me a lot of the, the have Stanley cup run in terms of just the goaltender, just standing on his head, some timely overtime goals getting there. Uh, I'm cheering for him in the final at this point. 31 and 32 doesn't really matter at this point. They're probably going to trade the pick anyhow, but I can't help but root for the most chaotic team left in the playoffs. A hundred percent. Whoever wins, I just, I think this run is going to be magical. And, and to be honest, like I don't begrudge them. I know it's like, oh, the division or whatever. I don't begrudge them. Like if they win the Stanley Cup and the Canadians didn't two years ago, I'm still going to be excited. I'm still going to be happy for them. I, I like I, I like I said I can't begrudge them, but you know what? There's still plenty of time to go in the playoffs. We're gonna think early, and this is another listener suggested topic, and we're gonna talk about opening night roster as of now. What could it potentially look like? And that's coming up in just one moment here on Locked On Canadians. All right, Scott, let's talk about this because we got this topic. Again, I was whining about the offseason and our wonderful listeners came through for us. And let me just find the person who who said this to me so I can credit them accurately uh, because I don't want to credit the wrong person. But essentially, they suggested that uh, we talk about an early look at the opening season roster. This is from Mac D. Pete on Twitter. So, let's do that. I have Cap Friendly <laughs> up in front of me, because, and it is rolled over to the 2023-2024 season. Let's start with... We'll start in the forward group here, because the entire defense is almost... Is actually, ironically, all signed through next season. So, we don't have to worry about that right now. Uh, if we're starting in the forward group... Nick Suzuki, Brendan Gallagher, Josh Anderson are all signed through next season. They will be here. Uh, Yol Armia, Kirby Doc, Jake Evans, Rem Pitlick has another year left on his deal. Uh, Mike Hoffman and Christian Dvorak. Uh, and then unsigned RFA, Dennis Garyanov, RFA, Michael Pizzetta, both with arbitration rights. 
UFA Alex Belzeal, UFA Jonathan Drouin, and UFA Chris Tierney. Chris Tierney is only 28 years old. What? I could have sworn he was like 32. Anyways, that's not the point. Um, I guess out of all of that, between you and I, we can lock in Nick Suzuki, Brendan Gallagher, Josh Anderson, Kirby Doc, Jake Evans for next season. That's at least six forwards. And on injured reserve is also Uri Slavkovsky, Cole Caulfield, Paul Byron, Sean Monahan, and Arbor Jackeye. Obviously, Slavkovsky is coming back next year, and Caulfield, we assume, will be signed in short order here. Um, I guess knows? the hard part. <laughs> yeah, it depends on who you're asking. So, like, opening night lineup, out of the forward group here, I think Hoffman will be here at the current moment in time. I think Armia is going to get traded this offseason or potentially bought out. I got to, I know that we talked about this last year. There was a time when you have a buyout window after uh, opening arbitration. And I'm wondering if they do that with Dennis Gurionov or Michael Pozzetta, that when you open an arbitration window and settle, I believe you get a buyout window of like 48 hours or something. And they use that. Uh, there, I don't think we're going to see a lot of forward chain or change in the forward group here, but I think, the names that are going to be coming up from the AHL that will be here, uh, you're going to have at least Rafael Harvey Pinard and Jesse Alonen, I think, are both going to be on the NHL roster next year. Sean Farrell is not a lock, not because I don't want him to be, but because I think he's going to take a little bit of time and be one of those top line young guys for the Rocket with Emil Heineman and someone like Xavier Simono or Joshua Wah next year. Not that I don't want him here, but because I think that there's just too many other bodies that are in the way right now. Um, oh, man, this gets harder because Rafael Harvey Pinard, also an RFA with arbitration rights. Uh, Lucas Condata, RFA. Mitchell Stevens, RFA. Joel Teasdale, RFA. Jesse Alonen, RFA. Anthony Richard, unrestricted free agent. I'm not really worried about any of these guys not getting re-signed. I think Condata might walk which is fine. Stevens is up in the air. He was good when he played at the end of last year. Uh, Teasdale's an interesting one because he's 24, finally got his call up, got his first goal in his first, uh, or got his first point in his first NHL game or second NHL game. So good for him on that. I guess, Laura, now the fun part comes on defense. Michael Matheson, Joel Edmondson, David Savard, Jordan Harris, Justin Barron, Caden Gooley, Jonathan Kovacevic, Chris Weidman, Arbor Jack Eye, and then down in the AHL, Logan Mayu, Jaden Struble, Matthias Norlinder, William Trudeau, and Gianni Fairbrother are all the players that are signed for next year. None of those AHL names will be in the NHL on opening night. I guess the hard part becomes you have eight defensemen plus Jack Eye coming off of IR. That's nine defensemen. Who who do we think is losing out on this one here? Oh, Weidman for sure. Weidman yeah, it, for sure, and Edmondson if they can trade him. That's my thought is Joel Edmondson's the one that I don't expect to see here. I think he's going to get traded by the draft just because it makes too much sense for him not to. He has a modified no trade clause, but I think if they move him, that brings him down to seven defensemen, eight with Jack Guy, and they can make that work. And they're just going to stick Weidman on waivers because I don't think they're going to want to lose Jonathan Kovacevic who has another two years on his deal, and they learned that they really liked a lot of what he brought to the table. Justin Barron is obviously I. here. Yeah, it's... I loved what he brought to the table. I also love Mr. his van, van life. life. Like, that's... <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, you, they're not going to send Jordan Harris down. He's an NHL player. They're not going to send Justin Barron down. He's proven that he can be an NHL player. They're not going to send Caden Gooley or Arbor Jack guy down, I think, because they've proven they can handle NHL minutes. And I don't think they want to lose Kovacevic on waivers because he's... Plug him in here, plug him in here, plug him in here. They really like him on there. And then it, it's going to get complicated. We're, defense is where I think the most movement is going to happen here. So um, on the bright side, at least they have a lot of guys on injury level deals. And I assume also Nikola Vodan, who is an RFA, will be back. Frederick Allard already signed over in Sweden. Corey Schoenman mentioned he wants an NHL shot. I don't think he will get that with the Canadians anymore. Madison Bowie up in the air as a UFA. And as we talked about in the goalie segment, Caden Primo and Jakob Dobish are the two players signed to uh, entry-level deals, but only Dobish is wa is uh, waiver-exempt. Slavkovsky, Jack, I, R, Gooley, Baron, and Harris are all waiver-exempt. 
the Canadians do not have many forwards who are waiver exempt going into next year, which will be interesting short of their guy. Mm, well, they're not signed. So I'm not hundred percent sure, but it looks like Harvey Pinard is the only waiver exempt guy from this past season and Sean Farrell as well. The opening night rosters, the forward group is going to look, I think, a lot like it does now. I know it's not exciting. You can add in Harvey Pinard, you can add in Yelona, and maybe Sean Farrell, but don't expect Owen Beck, don't expect Joshua, don't expect Philip Mashar to push and make that spot short of having an incredible camp. On defense, I think you're going to see a lot of young guys and David Savard and Mike Matheson. I think, yeah, that's it. I think, like, for me, it, the question is who gets traded this offseason? I think it's a harder question than people think, right? Because at the draft, there's going to be a lot of wheeling and dealing, but the off season is when players have the least value as opposed to the trade deadline when there's so much FOMO and a deadline where they have the most value. And like, I don't necessarily see any of the Canadians that the Habs are willing to part with being such a, like inciting a bidding war or like, you know, that kind of thing, inspiring a bidding war, not inciting, inspiring a bidding war. So it's going to be fun and tricky to see, but I think the big question is going to be who gets traded over the course of next season. And that's the thing is it's like, I think Joel Edmondson will have multiple bidders here. I really do. Just because one year, three and a half million dollars, Stanley cup champion guy who plays a lot of heavy minutes there. There are teams that want that, especially after they watched Radko Gudis in these playoffs. They're like, we want that guy that is a pain in the ass to play against Joel Edmondson while playing injured a lot last year, and I have no doubt he was playing injured most of last year, didn't have that same step he had in his first season. His first season with Jeff Petrie, it worked. They were great, and he was good. He did what he needed to. Not the best defenseman on the team, but he did exactly what this team needed. You could tell that step was not there this year as he battled that back injury a little bit, and David Savard's being asked to do too much, I think. I think someone like Joel Edmondson, who can play both sides, has that leadership, has that Stanley Cup, there are going to be teams calling. And as I'm looking at the cap situation here, the Canucks are over the, the cap limit already, but like Tampa's up against the limit, Calgary's up against the limit, Vegas is up against the limit, Boston's up against the limit, the Islanders, the Oilers, teams like that who are like, we're missing, you know, something here. And then Chicago, Anaheim, New Jersey is somehow $12 million under the floor. Uh, the Red Wings, the Coyotes, the Hurricanes, who already had Joel Edmondson, there are teams that are going to be looking to add that presence. The Sabres, who I know, talking to Buffalo fans, they want a guy who's nasty on defense to kind of help those kids there to be there and be that snarl. And I go, well, don't trade Joel Edmondson in division because it'll make your life a living hell for it. But teams are going to pay for that at some point. Even if it's not immediate, like in this offseason here, they Joel Edmondson will be on another team before too long next year. I have absolutely zero doubt of that right now. That's exactly it. And so we will continue to follow uh, what happens throughout the course of the off season, as well as during the season, we have tons of draft content coming up for you really, 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 really soon. So make sure you're subscribed to this podcast, wherever you get your podcasts, as well as on YouTube, you can find us on Twitter at L O underscore Canadians. You'll find Scott on Twitter at Scott Matley. You'll find me on Twitter at the active stick. You can also email us at locked on Canadians at gmail.com. We're really happy that you guys are suggesting topics. So please keep it coming. You can reach us at any of those channels uh suggest topic ideas and also ask mailback questions and we're really really happy to bring them to you thank you so so much for listening and we will see you tomorrow